From caucus developments to preparations at the State House for the 2023 legislative session, we gather a few familiar political reporters for a year-end roundtable discussion on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, December 23rd edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. 2022 is drawing to a close, so what were the top political stories of the past year and what's ahead in 2023? We have three of Iowa's top political reporters here at the roundtable to discuss those issues. Aaron Murphy is with the Cedar Rapids Gazette. Clay Masters is with Iowa Public Radio. And Brianne Fonnen-Steele is with the Des Moines Register. Brianne, you've written a lot about the Iowa Democratic caucuses. So what's going on for folks who haven't been sort of following this drama? Well, we finally got the big decision, right? Democrats gathered in Washington, D.C. earlier this month, and they all met in a conference room, and they decided Iowa's out, South Carolina's in. And this came after President Joe Biden weighed in, finally made his, his choices known, where he would like to move Iowa completely out of the early window, move up South Carolina, have New Hampshire and Nevada hold their primaries on the same day, followed by Michigan and Georgia. And so this is a big change. This is a, a big move to shake up the calendar, to bring in some more diverse voices, to replace Iowa, which has been holding these first in the nation caucuses for 50 years. This still needs to be ratified by the full DNC in February at their meeting, but this is really kind of the writing on the wall, right? This is the decision we've been waiting for. Iowa is very likely no longer going to be first. Clay, was this a big surprise? First off, no, it didn't feel like a big surprise. I remember on caucus, not, well, the morning after the Iowa caucuses, sitting in a coffee house and an NPR was there. I was being interviewed, and the, one of the first questions I got was, what does this kind of do for the future of the Iowa caucuses? Uh, and my answer, I think, at the time was, like, it just adds fuel to the fire, right? The Democratic caucuses have been panned by a lot of critics both across the country and there are people in Iowa that have enjoyed the Iowa Democratic caucuses but see that it's time for it to move by the wayside. And President Joe Biden, in the letter that came out the day before that decision was made, kind of laid all these arguments out that we've been hearing for a long time. Number one, Iowa not as representative of the rest of the country when it comes to diversity. Uh, number two, caucuses are a system that doesn't allow as much participation that a primary election does. And the number th three has to do with uh, competition, that in a uh, general election, Iowa is not the purple state that it once was, and they want President Biden, as well as uh, others that are on that committee that make this rules, uh, they want more competitive states going early. Aaron? Yeah, well, it was, if anything was a surprise to me, it was how it unfolded at the very end. Uh, we were sitting here waiting for weeks and weeks, months, uh, maybe for the Democratic National Committee, the National Democratic Party's Rules and Bylaws Committee was taking this up and discussing it, and they were going to put together a plan. And we hadn't heard that, and they punted it until after the election. And then uh, while we're waiting for that decision, President Biden is the one who, who swooped in ultimately and, and said, here, uh, let, let's do this. Um, that, that just kind of fascinated me about the process. But yeah, th this was, uh, for all the reasons Clay and Brianne have already laid out, uh, the outcome was not even remotely surprising. Brianne, was Joe Biden's recommendation surprising given, given his experience in the Iowa caucuses? <laughs> Well, I think everybody was waiting on the president to weigh in, right? This is a big change, and having the president kind of lay out what he wants to do helps coalesce the party behind him. 
But as far as which states he selected, I think people were a little surprised. You know, certainly he has not fared well in Iowa in his, you know, three, three times running in the caucuses. But South Carolina this last time, voters there really are credited with propelling him into the White House. So seeing them now at the front of the line makes a lot of sense, particularly if, if he runs again, as he's indicated he is likely to do. But I think, you know, more surprising is adding a state like Georgia, which has historically not been favorable for Democrats into the mix and elevating uh, some of those other later states. Clay, the Democratic National Committee's Rules and Bylaws <laughs> Committee has given this new group of states until January 5th to present, I guess, a, a memo saying, yes, we're going to do the things you told us to do. Georgia's yeah. Republican Secretary of State has already said, eh, 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 eh. Yeah, so it's a committee within a committee making decisions to get back to the full committee. A lot of fun to talk about on the radio. Uh, but it is that you're seeing this happen in Georgia where, you know, the Republican National Committee has made a decision that they're going to stick with the old traditional Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. And the proposal that the committee within the committee has recommended at the Democratic level is starting in South Carolina, then Nevada and New Hampshire on the same day, followed by Georgia, then Michigan. Did I leave somebody out? No. Nope. Nevada? I said Nevada. Yeah. So you're having to have all these rules come for these state parties, and the Georgia Secretary of State has, is a Republican and has said, we're going to be voting on the same day. And so you start having these different problems that, that come forward that some of the people that wanted to keep Iowa first were kind of warning that this was going to be a, a problem to work out. And we're seeing that come to fruition now, but they, the time's ticking again. And New Hampshire also has um, right. <clears throat> politely said, no, thank politely? you. <laughs> <laughs> as politely as New Hampshire talks about being moved I out of first in the nation I think they said something like uh, I, uh, the DNC didn't give New Hampshire the first in the nation primary. They're not going to take, take it away. away. Yep. I think it's been really interesting to see the states kind of grapple with these decisions, right? Because I, you know, the DNC has been a little bit dismissive, I think, of, of what it takes for these states to move around and to address their laws and to address the intricacies of state election laws. Iowa has a law that says it needs to hold a caucus before any primary state. New Hampshire has a law. And so these states are now trying to figure out how, you know, how do we follow our law? How do we stick with the DNC? And what decisions do we make? So it's going to be really interesting, you know, you talked about the new year, how Iowa Democrats come to terms with this and what, what they do, whether they follow the DNC's prescription or they try and do something else. And that, that's a good point. And I apologize to the source of this, who I was reading, who said this, um, because it, that name is escaping me, but I was reading about someone's kind of view of the evolution of the DNC's role in the calendar. For the longest time, the DNC really managed the calendar to where now it's essentially trying to set the calendar, and, and that's newish, and you know, we're having the mess that we have now because of it. I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm just wondering if there's a defibrillator here that might revive the Iowa caucuses because of these hurdles that we've discussed. Does anyone think that the Iowa caucuses have a slim chance of surviving on the Democratic side at being first? Well, it, I guess it depends a little bit how you're defining it, right? We can play some word games here. The, the Iowa Democratic Party, Chairman Ross Wilburn, has said that they're going to hold a first-in-the-nation caucus regardless, right? They can do that. That's fine. It just won't be recognized by the DNC. And the DNC can put in a lot of sanctions to say anyone who comes to campaign there is going to get dinged. Maybe they don't get to participate in debates. Maybe they're going to have all of these other, other knocks that are going to dissuade people from campaigning here. And so... Iowans can meet, they can cast their preferences just like they always do, but what makes the caucuses, right, is the presence of all of these candidates, the, the participation in the campaigning and the discussion that happens before then, and that clearly wouldn't happen under this new plan. Let's shift to the Republican Party's caucuses. The Republican National Committee voted this summer to have the Iowa caucuses first. Aaron, what do you see on the horizon? Well, <clears throat> what we same thing we already see in the rearview mirror, which is candidates coming to Iowa. Um, now, interestingly, that um, those journeys, that travel has waned here um, ever since former President Trump announced his candidacy. So we, we haven't seen as much activity. Maybe it's the weather we're having here in Iowa this December that's uh, slowing things up. <clears throat> we'll see as we turn into the new year. 
um, I expect that we'll still see candidates, but it has been interesting that um, ever since former President Trump's announcement, we've been saying for ever that uh, that was the big question mark, and, and once he decided whether he was going to get into this field would tell us what we need to know about the rest. And to this point, it has stunted the Iowa Republican cavalcade. Now, will that continue? It, we'll see. Clay, uh, I'm struck by the fact that not especially that the Iowa Republican Party's state central committee, that's the governing board for the party, has said we're going to be neutral, which they've done in past caucuses. But I covered um, former Governor Terry Branstead in November at an event, and he said he was not going to endorse Donald Trump. And he said this less than 24 hours after Trump had announced he was running again. Um, Branstead said it was just too early to endorse. What do you make of this, this sort of holding back, we're going to be neutral, we're not going to get involved? Well, first off, I think a lot of that has to do with the scrutiny that's come on the Democratic side with the Iowa caucuses. The Republicans, uh, the, you know, for years, decades, the Iowa Democrats and the Iowa Republicans have been able to come together and support this first in the nation thing that they've had. And you're starting to see the strings get pulled on the Democratic side of the yarn ball that's kind of coming unwound. And so if they want to keep the Iowa caucuses in 2028, I think they need to present as much of a level playing field as they can. So that's why you'll see candidates, Ashley Henson, the congresswoman from Cedar Rapids, was on uh, a couple weeks ago and was saying she plans to uh, endorse at some point, I think she even said. So we might see some of that later on. But another thing, too, is to Aaron's point, I think part of the reason we're not seeing a whole lot of presidential hopefuls in the state has to do with just how early uh, the former president actually announced he's going to run for president. I mean, I remember uh, we had a, a big cattle call of uh, Republican presidential hopefuls here in uh, early 2015 in the state, but none of, none of those people had declared that they were actually running at that point. So I think that the, everybody's just kind of waiting to see, as we're looking at poll numbers for the former president and seeing that Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, seems to be doing a little better than, than the former president in polls. I think people are just still kind of getting an idea idea of, of what the playing field looks like. It's just kind of a weird year, right? We've got a former president running again who is not an incumbent. We've got Joe Biden who says he intends to run but hasn't formally announced or, or you know, kind of made that official. <coughs> and so it's just an odd year where, where we've got two, you know, an incumbent and a pseudo incumbent kind of running again, trying to figure out what that looks like. And so it's definitely slowed down. But I, I would think, you know, everyone is kind of waiting for the first person to really jump in the pool, right, beyond Donald Trump and to kind of see what happens next. And there's, I think there's two most likely names there. And one of them, Claire already said, which is Ron DeSantis. And the other is Mike Pence, who <clears throat> has been to Iowa a number of times already and has been willing to speak about his differences between him and the former president. So those are the two in particular that I'm watching to see when their next trip to Iowa is. And I, Brienne makes the great point that I had made a note here. Um, it feels like we have just completely obliterated the uh, definition of the word unprecedented in the last six or seven years in politics. Uh, but here we are again. It really is, to Brienne's point. I mean, we have a, a, a former president running again, but not as an incumbent. I don't know when the last time that's happened, if it, if it ever has and an incumbent president who everybody's saying is he actually going to run right right, right. so <laughs> yeah. so everybody else is figuring this out too that's why we don't have any answers yet ran one last point about the iowa caucuses and then we'll move on to uh, the legislature but um you know when you look at the iowa caucuses three strikes and you're out if you will the first strike was actually the 2012 iowa caucuses when they declared mitt romney the winner on election night not caucus night and then a few days later Rick Santorum won up being, wound up being declared the winner. I mean, what's the pressure on the Iowa Republican Party to manage and run caucuses to set them up for 2028? I think the pressure is enormous, right? They've had problems in the past uh, with getting the results right on, on caucus night and with doing that accurately and efficiently, just like the Democrats have. And now, now, as Clay says, the strings are being pulled, the yarn ball is coming apart, you know, 
I think there's enormous pressure on Republicans to prove that they can still do it. And they're, they're pro they have the benefit of a much simpler process being much more straightforward. The current chair of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, is a big fan of Iowa and has said she's committed to keeping Iowa Republicans first. But she's not going to be in office forever. They have to continue proving with every iteration that they deserve to keep doing this. Okay, uh, viewers, uh, get your calendars out. January 9th is a big day. Aaron, it's the start of the 2023 Iowa legislative session. What are the hints about the agenda that Republicans who are in charge are going to pursue? Yeah, I think there's a few um, issues. Obviously, there will be a lot that will come up, but there's a few that really stand out that we can pretty safely expect. Uh, we'll hear a bunch about. Uh, we're going to hear about taxes again. Uh, Iowa's budget is in good shape. There's a billion plus dollar surplus. Uh, Republicans are going to try and cut taxes. They've already taken a huge crack at income taxes. It sounds like property tax is going to be on the table this time. Uh, the governor is going to come back with her school choice bill, vouchers, scholarships, whatever your preferred shorthand is. We're going to hear a lot about that. It'll be interesting to see with a new legislature, a slightly uh, grown Republican majority, and some new members within that majority as well, uh, whether the votes are there for that this time. And then the other thing uh, it will just be kind of interesting to watch, and, and this has some outside, outside influences too, is, is the abortion issue. And what I mean by outside influences is uh, the, there's a big bill, a case before the Iowa Supreme Court that is going to get a hearing and a ruling at some point that kind of is uh, you know hovering over all this so the question is will we still legis see legislation on that front now or will republicans be fine to sit back and wait for that court ruling to act clay what about pipelines do you think the legislature will do anything they sort of started and then put it on hold last yeah, time around. in 2021 you were seeing this interesting coalition of uh, landowners, farmers that were concerned about imminent domain and these carbon sequestration pipeline companies with these proposed pipelines being able to just come in and take over to build these pipelines. And this coalition was built between them and then environmentalists who were saying that uh, carbon sequestration pipelines, that's not going to solve the climate crisis. So you saw that coalition coming together. There was some work done on it ahead of the midterm, uh, kind of got punted a little bit. So it's going to be interesting to see because we've had all these counties that have put forth these ordinances, especially in uh, western Iowa. The, uh, the counties are not ringing a bell in my head. One right of them now. is Shelby. One of them is Shelby County. Mm -hmm. And then you've seen uh, more recently in Lynn County, the Board of Supervisors there has been talking about uh, setbacks that they would have from, uh, you know, places, uh, dwellings where people come together, uh, homes. And they had to like put pause on this so that they could sort it out because you were seeing the companies didn't like the regulations that were being proposed and you were seeing the anti-pipeline activists coming out that are opposed to it. So you're kind of seeing some different splits within uh, not along party lines about how people are coming down on these concerns. So I'll be watching to see if there's anything coming forward on that for sure. In one shared thread between a couple of those issues, uh, get comfortable with the phrase local control oh, if you're yeah. following your legislative news this session. Uh, because to Clay's point, the, the pipeline stuff right now is being set at the local level. Do state lawmakers come in and override some of those? And the property tax issue that I talked about, that's not a state tax. That's, that's a tax set at the local level by, by cities and counties. Um, and so anything the state decides to do will have a very direct impact. will essentially be telling local governments what they can and can't do. So you're going to hear a lot about that tug of war between local and state government. Brian, you and I were um, recently on a conference call with U.S. Senator Joni Ernst, and a vote that she recently took um, has created some controversy within Republican parties at the county level. That's right. Uh, Joni Ernst was one of 12 Republican senators who helped get the Respect for Marriage Act across the finish line. Joe Biden signed that into law, and that protects... Um, gay marriages, it protects interracial marriages, but it's getting a lot of pushback, obviously, from people who, who still oppose gay marriage as a principle, um, and also those who feel that it infringes on religious liberty. So some of Iowa's more conservative counties, um, we've seen pushback there. They've, they've met as their, you know, kind of county party apparatus and taken votes to effectively censure Joni Ernst and also state, uh, excuse me, U.S. Representative Marionette Miller-Meeks 
over that same vote. And so it's interesting to see a push and pull there, but we asked Senator Ernst about this and about that pushback, and she said, I stand by my vote. I think this this protects religious liberty, and I think it helps, uh, you know, Iowans who need the certainty and, and the, the general consensus, even among re Republicans, she said, is that this is the direction we're heading, and I think it's an important vote to take. And among 99 county Republican parties, we're talking a handful. I we're, mean, right. I wouldn't use all the fingers on my hands if, we, if I counted how many counties and, have done this. Yeah, and to that point, it's interesting, uh, Congresswoman Ashley Hinson uh, from Eastern Iowa has not thus far um, faced this similar blowback from the county Republican parties in, in her district. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe simple as they haven't met yet and haven't had a chance to do that, but uh, as of now, so it's just kind of interesting to see, especially with Congresswoman Miller Meeks, who's also in eastern Iowa, um, the, the reaction different between her district and Congresswoman Henson's. As we near the end of this year, let's look back to November and what happened during the election. We really haven't, as a group on this program, had a chance to dis discuss that. Clay, the only candidate on the Democratic ticket who won a statewide race was Rob Sand. Um, what does that tell us about the Iowa electorate? Uh, and it was, that was, Rob Sand is the state auditor of, of Iowa, and we didn't even know right away that he won. I mean, it was, it was a, a long drawn out process to see if any Democrats uh, survived at the statewide level. Tom Miller, the attorney general, went by the wayside losing to Brenna Byrd. Longest serving atten attorney general in the country. That's right. Michael Fitzgerald, the state treasurer, lost his reelection bid to uh, Robbie Smith. I don't know. Oh, yeah. you had some and, facts and that he, you were going to lay down. Well, and he's also the longest serving right. <laughs> uh, treasurer in the country. That's right. Uh, Chuck Grassley won uh, by a good margin, and uh, Kim Reynolds won by an even healthier margin. And the state legislature, I mean, if you were a Republican in Iowa and you were seeing the national narrative of Republicans didn't do as well as we thought, the Republicans here would think you're watching the wrong show. Yeah, so we're watching for the red wave. So if you think about what the wave looks like at a sporting event when the, the crowd all <laughs> cheers, stands up, what actually happened is they tried to do the wave and only Iowa stood up. Yeah, it, it and looks Florida. Like. Florida did. Yeah. And, and Florida, yeah, yeah. Caught, there was just a couple of people out there, and, and Iowa was one of them. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the Republicans did exceptionally well here, um, uh, bucking the trend uh, that we saw in other states across the country. Uh, Clay mentioned that, you know, Rob Sand won by something like 2,100 votes statewide. I think when um, you look at the congressional races, you had Ashley Henson won by something like 18 points. Marionette Miller Meeks won by far more than six votes this time. <laughs> but if you look at the Axne Nunn race, that was also a very slim margin. That was very close, and it, you know, I think we we talked on this program a lot about that race and, and, you know, feeling like it could go either way. And so you look at that one being being as narrow as it was, even with this red wave in Iowa, and I think it's really telling. And so it'll be interesting to see over the next two years what happens. But, you know, you look back at how that campaign went and perhaps there were some unforced errors with, with Cindy Axney's campaign. You know, she took a trip to France. Uh, and and caught some blowback from Republican messaging on that, not being present to take a key vote. Um, you know, all of the issues with her stock trading became an issue that, that, you know, Iowans saw on mailers and on TV. And so that was a very close race that, you know, obviously went uh, in Zach Nunn's favor. And if you look at the numbers in Polk County, which is the largest county in Iowa and obviously the largest county in that district, she won it by a far larger margin in 2018 when she was first elected. Uh, than she did this time around. So turnout was down in a midterm for her in Iowa's most popular county. Let's talk about the person who won by the biggest margin, largest margin. Aaron, what's next for Kim Reynolds? Well, let me say first, when I get a chance to ask her, I will. I hope that is sooner than later. We've uh, had a collective issue as uh, State House reporters having a chance to ask Governor Reynolds questions lately. Uh, so I look forward to asking her. That question, we get a chance. Um, that'll be interesting. Um, she obviously, at the least in the immediate, immediate future, um, comes into the legislative session with, uh, I don't know if she'll use the term mandate, but she could. She, as Clay mentioned, she won by a big margin. The, the state legislature grew even more Republican. Um, so she'll feel emboldened to um, move forward with whatever her agenda will be. We already talked about the vouchers. That'll obviously be on the table. Um, she'll be in the property tax discussion. Um, 
So she'll feel emboldened to, uh, uh, you know, get things passed in this legislative session. And then beyond that, uh, I, I don't have a lot of insight. It'll be really interesting to watch. She obviously comes up in national discussions. Could she be, a, um, if not a presidential candidate herself, which we haven't seen any indication of yet, could she be a running mate to someone uh, who uh, really starts to take off as a candidate? Uh, that, that'll be interesting to watch. Less than one minute left. I'm going to let each of you tell our viewers something that you have done that you would like them to see before the end of the year. Brianne, we'll start with you. Well, uh, I have written a lot of words about the Iowa caucuses, and so there's a project on Des Moines Register .com, uh, looking at the history of the caucuses and kind of all of the things that built since 1972 to bring us to this moment. Clay? Um, I'm going to go uh, politics adjacent, I guess. Uh, I've been spending the better part of the last couple years going up to Clayton County where there's a Bloody Run Creek is a small trout stream in the Iowa's Driftless region. There's concerns about a massive feedlot expanding, and I'm going to continue to be reporting on what moves forward with there because there's a lot of environmental concerns about that sensitive part of the state. Aaron? It's just outside your time frame because it won't start until right after the new year, but we put a lot of work into our legislative preview um, stories. Uh, we'll have a whole series the week leading up to the first day of session talking about all the issues that we expect to hear about at the Capitol during the session, really getting Iowans ready for uh, what's to come when state lawmakers start doing their work again. Well, thank you for the work that you do. Appreciate it, and I'm sure I will appreciate it again in 2023. You can watch every episode of Iowa Press at iowapbs.org. For everyone here at the network, happy holidays. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.